Apollo. <laughs> you ever been to the Apollo? Boo. I used to go there every no, week. I haven't been to the every Apollo. week I used really? to go. I can tell you some good stories. <laughs> All right, we're gonna we're gonna convene the meeting at this time. Remind me now. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Village Council uh, Budget Workshop meeting for our 2019-2020 uh, fiscal year. Would everyone please, oh, it is Tuesday night, July 2nd, and it's 6.30 p.m. So would everyone please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Diane, please let the record show that all members of the council are present for the meeting. Yes, ma'am. And yes, it is that time of year already. It's the beginning of July. Uh, a few days will be July 4th. And we are working on our uh, first budget workshop for our next uh, budget year, which takes effect on October 1. So I don't know where the year is going, but it's going. With that, Stanley, I'll turn this over to you. Uh, I guess we'll start out with a bu budget message from the village manager. Thank you, Mayor. As you said, we're here for the budget workshop for the 1920 budget year and the five-year capital from 20 to 24. This budget uh, that we're presenting, we did use a little less than $30,000 from the rate stabilization fund to balance the budget, and we are transferring $1.4 million from the utility sale proceeds to the capital. If you remember some years back when we did the five-year uh, projections and forecast, uh, we said we would be transferring uh, $2.5 million from the uh, utility sale proceeds uh, for the capital and not be putting it into the general fund anymore other than the rate stabilization fund. Since we, then, we have gotten the sales tax, so we, have, we budget less into the, into the capital. Uh, every other year in the five-year capital, we transfer 500000 from the utility sale proceeds, but this particular year, uh, to balance things and keep the projects that we're, we're, we believe we can get done this next year, on, uh, we're transferring the $1.4 million. The, um, the use of the rate stabilization fund, uh, most likely next year will be, be a little bit larger. The reason it's so low this year is because some sales that we had. We did sell about three years ago one of the fire stations, and then uh, two years ago another fire station, and then this past year, uh, year not this budget, but the budget for the um, property on Okeechobee Boulevard that, uh, for the uh, memory care and uh, assisted living facility. Uh, with those sales, uh, it, it actually has carried us these past several years without uh, using the utility sale proceeds to balance the general fund budget. Now, as far as how much we use next year, obviously, I couldn't tell you. It's going to depend greatly on how much of the new construction gets online. Uh, this year, only 5% new construction is online in our increased values. So we do anticipate that much more Crestwood development will be online and, and that all the apartments on south of Southern Boulevard got their occupancy this year. So they should be online next year, too. As usual, we'll have the, the budget overview by their finance department, finance director, I mean, and then uh, we'll go to each uh, department by department. And then the village engineer will present the, the five-year capital budget. So with that, I'll turn it over to Stan. Thank you. The budget for, t I changed the cover page. Mm. Shock. We noticed. It's gorgeous. It's the same for 17 years. Anyway, <laughs> budget for. You sure that was a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> Don't get them started. Okay. <laughs> the 2019-2020 is $45.1 million. The general fund represents 56% of that number. Capital projects represents 21%. Reserves, 20%. And stormwater, 3%. This year again, although not as much, property values are up, 4.4%. Tax rate is being maintained at 1.92, as it has for more than 20 years. Staff changes exist in finance, engineering, and parks and recreation, which I'll speak to later in the presentation. Now, as usual, we incorporate 
uh, various strategic plan initiatives. Ad valorem tax, as I said, uh, property values have increased by 4.4%, from 2.85 billion to 2.98 billion, 133 million increase. And again, we're maintaining our operating millage rate at 1.92. The, um, that 2.85 that we had last year, uh, that was the peak in 2008 before the crash. Uh, because we collect our monies from property tax, it, 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 it lags the, the recession uh, much, much slower than the federal government's uh, revenues and the state government revenues. Our low was 2012 with a little bit over a 36% reduction. So this is the first year uh, that our ad valorem is above what our peak was in 2008. So it took, Thank you, Stan. It took 11 years to get whole again, at least mm -hmm. from that perspective. Good. Now the table here shows values of property and what the tax bill would be for each. Now the 150, 212, and 274, the numbers from last year, as I do every year, are increased by the increase in the property valuation. So these were 4.4% less last year. 150, 212, and 274 have a tax bill of $192, $311, and $430, respectively. Our general fund has a revenue of $25.4 million. Property taxes make up 21%. Other taxes and fees, 23%. Licenses and permits, 13%. <coughs> Intergovernmental, 18%, charges for services, 2%, fines, 2%, miscellaneous, 4%, and current year fund balance, 17%. On the expenditure side, personal services, 43%, contractual services, 39%. Contractual services are primarily the police department contract, so personal services are around 82%. Other charges and services, 15%. Commodities, 3%. Other operating expense, department capital outlay, and grants and aid, all under 1%. <clears throat> our merit adjustments are programmed at an average of 3.5% for all employees. A cost of living adjustment has been included at 2.3% based on a 12-month running average from April 18 to March of 19, and medical insurance cost premiums are based on market projections. Reclassifications in the budget this year are in engineering, GIS coordinated to GIS manager, finance, accounting manager to assistant finance director, information systems manager to information systems director. In parks and recreation, two part-time facility attendants will become full-time. Position additions in engineering, a GIS technician, and in finance, an information system specialist. Next is the stormwater utility fund. The revenue is $1.26 million, of which 86% is made up of fees and the fund balance represents 14%. On the expenditure side, personal services are 48%, contractual services are less than 1%, other charges and services are 39%, commodities are 4%, other operating expense 1%, and transfers are 8%. Capital Improvement Fund this year is 18.4% million dollars, recreation facilities fund, 3%, beautification fund, less than 1%, impact fee fund, 9%, sales surtax fund, 22%, general capital improvement fund, 16%, utility fund, less than 1%, that's the stormwater utility, and reserves, 49%. And that, Mr. Mayor, is a summary of our 2020 budget. 
Any questions from members on council? Okay. Proceed. <coughs> Question. Thank you. Okay. The first four I'll take care of. The first one is the village council budget on page 33. still have the scholarships in at 10,000, uh, the high school graduation at 1,000, Arbor Day at 1,000, and Relay for Life at 1,000. All the other items within that category are pretty much the same. The, um, the overall budget is at 301,652. Any questions on the council's budget? There's a couple things whether we can talk about them. Right now we have the local scholarships at 10,000. Was that going to, and I don't know if we want to talk about where it comes from, but is that going to come from the golf tournament? Was that the thought? The golf, the, during strategic planning, we did talk about uh, funding the, the scholarships um, through the golf tournament. To do that, the way we, we price the golf tournament is we really just add about five bucks to our cost and then that buys the giveaways and things like that and, and expenses so we don't do it to make money uh, to cover the ten thousand dollars we would have to add seventy dollars to the to the um, to the entrance so it would go from 75 to basically a hundred and fifty to, to cover it if that's what if that's what the goal of the council was of course obviously just raising it doubling it doesn't necessarily mean we would fill it up now we do have it scheduled at the village golf course for February 1st, I believe, in the first week of February on a Saturday. So it should be great weather, and we should get hopefully great weather and should get a good turnout. Yeah, when we, when we discussed this, uh, we, did, we did conclude by giving staff guidance to still include this in the budget as we always have because there was information that he just shared that we didn't have then, right. <laughs> okay? Right. Um, we don't want to double the price for the golf course, uh, for the golf tournament, uh, to be honest. So we're, we're all where we were in prior years. We're, we're putting the money in the budget. We're still funding the, um, the uh, scholarship through that funding mechanism of budgeting it. And we'll continue to march and see how this works. So a thought I had with the golf tournament, because I think the issue was is attendance or participation and over the years how it's declined. So my thought was is if we take that whatever the dollar amount is that we're charging for sponsorships and per player is then have that go towards a fund where then would be divided up amongst the schools. So now what you're doing is you're getting the residents to now play and a portion of that would go back to their school and do it as a fundraiser for them. Uh, well, you're talking about a couple hundred dollars right now. <laughs> well, right now, but that's what I'm saying. So if we do it, and if you sell out and you have 18 teams, 18 foursomes that are out there playing, that it will yeah, then that, create, and now that's a reason for them to come in and play. What he just reported was by, at the pricing level we're at now, we just cover our expenses, essentially. So there's no excess funds to do anything with. And that, uh, that would be a complete deviation of new policy uh, to create a fund that we're going to disperse out to, to organizations. That's not something well, policy-wise, we, we have ever done. So, well, so there's an option to do something different, but then- We just, we just said we don't want to double, we're not going to double the price. You don't, right, you don't have to double it, because the thought was it's to double it to get the $10,000. No, no. What, you would have to double it to get 10000 We'd so have to double it, yeah. Well, the point is, we, we, I think what I would suggest, we just leave things as they are. And the only difference is we're, we're changing the time frame when we have the tournament, but everything else would be the same. So then the tournament would just break even then instead it, of generating revenue. As it has. Revenue. Yeah, I didn't, like I said, when we talked about this, we didn't really have those numbers. We didn't talk about those numbers. Right. And I think that was the attendance yeah. was an issue. But well, I thought I was under the impression that we were, we, we were doing more than breaking an evening. But upon a further investigation, <laughs> that, <laughs> that appears to be the financial reality. So. And if Lou has any, uh, anything yeah. to add to how you price this and what you do. Yeah. It, it, you know, when we have it on the 4th of July, uh, the cost is approximately uh, $75. The cost will go up doing it in, in, uh, the, season. in the winter months because it's, you're in peak season. Uh, 
uh, matter of fact, we've already put a deposit down. We are looking to, one, expand. I think you're going to get more golfers than we have in the past because of the weather uh, and sponsorships. You know, we're looking at raising the fee for sponsorships where I think we will make money. We're, we're hoping to make a significant amount having it in the winter months. Well, by selling because, sponsorships. Right, by, by the sponsorships. That's, because when, yeah. when people realize that it's going towards something, mm -hmm. you know, and not just out there for recreation and, and whatever happens, happens. You know, when they know it's going for, whether it's a scholarship fund or, you know, anything, um, they're going to come out and they'll pay that extra money because... You know, there's a lot of nonprofits out there that are doing golfing tournaments, and they're making a, a ton of money. So we really are looking very optimistic on this. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I had a question for Selena. I, um, I guess exactly what is it? Uh, I'm not getting what it is that you're looking. Are we looking at, you know, taking? money from the golf tournament and putting it into a specific fund for scholarships or for schools or what is what is I guess I'm not clear on no it was to my understanding that a thought would be is you're taking the money from the golf tournament and putting it towards the ten thousand dollars for the scholarships that we give out which is already a budget line item so over the years because attendance has declined my thought was is if you take that money so instead of keep the line item that we have for the scholarships but now take the money that we generate, the revenue we generate, which will then attract people to come in and do whole sponsorships and buy foursomes and buy sponsorships if they know a portion of those funds or all the proceeds then go towards the local schools. Well, so that was my thought but, on that end. But the local schools, you're just bringing that up. That was not part of what we discussed. It wasn't, no, it wasn't the, because that's the, we, yeah. We were very clear, we discussed this and said, no other, we're not looking to do other scholarship fund, uh, other, Funding. We we were just looking at funding, the the uh, the scholarships. Mm -hmm. Okay, and saying you know rather than have that come out of taxpayer dollars, if we could get, make that, because uh, once upon a time we used to have the golf tournament used to fund uh, a scholarship type fund, uh, but that was that outlived this this reality. And and one of the things we don't want to do is go back to some of the problems we ran in before, and the problems that you run into is if you open up and start providing uh, funding for one cause, a 1501c3. The other 100 are gonna be standing up saying, well, what about us? You guys, well, and you guys are picking your best, your, your favorite. And we, years and years ago, mm -hmm. right, the, the council get, almost got into a jam like that. And it was out of that situation that the policy came out that said, you know what? We're not gonna fund any of these 501c3s. That way we don't run into that problem. Right. Funding, by funding the scholarship fund, those are taxpayer dollars that we're allocating now. And, and the thought was, rather than use taxpayer dollars for the scholarship funding, that may be a better approach to do it. And that's, that was nothing more than that. It was not something to look at creating a new you know, flow of cash for other, other reasons. See, my, my thought, or my understanding of what Right. Selena was saying is, okay, we've got an allied item, $10,000 we're paying for the scholarship. Let's say we get $8,000 clear in the golf tournament. The $8,000 from the golf tournament goes to the $10,000 of the scholarship, and it's only coming from $2,000 general tax taxpayer revenue. Is that... What you were saying, because that's, that's, that's not what I—that's not what she was saying. Okay, no. that, that's yeah. what I was understanding. So I was no. misunderstanding. What you described just now is what we agreed we would do right. at the strategic planning meeting. What okay. you described. Okay, that's, so that's why I was confused. I'm, yeah, it's yeah. something different. But then, yeah. if that's because now that's a new line item—that's a new item then is where these funds are going to go towards would be for scholarships. So if you're if you're anticip if you're anticipating generating a lot more revenue that we have because of scholarships or if there was a cause for it then what are your thoughts on using the money for? Because my thought was the PTA. Don't, don't ask him that. That's not a question uh, for him. The answer to your question is, if we generate more funds mm -hmm. than needed to fund the scholarship this year, that just goes into pot for the next year's scholarships. But now, when we said this, we said we would protect the scholarships by making sure it was in the budget. Mm -hmm. So not knowing what would happen with the tournament funding-wise, we wanted to make sure we had funding in the budget 
to fund the scholarships. And that's the mechanism that we said we would go forward in. But if there's excess funds on a given fiscal year, that's great. That rolls over to the next year. So, so if we start the next year with $3,000 already in the fund, for example, mm -hmm. from I a budgeting okay, standpoint, then, right. Assuming we don't increase the scholarships, assuming we stay at 10,000, we only have to budget seven, all right, until we get to a point where this thing flows on its own and, and it's self-sufficient. <laughs> Go ahead. If, if I may, uh, yeah, yeah it, you know, once we know where the funds are going to go, that's what we want to advertise. It's going towards Lou, XYZ. the funds will go towards the scholarship <laughs> funds. There's no okay. discussion about yeah. other... Okay? Yep. I'm sorry, Jeff wanted to speak. I, I was just simply going to say, so this is the first year we were actually getting to do this during the season. It, it'll be interesting, and I understand what Selena's saying about if you put a purpose out there like scholarships, you could attract a lot more uh, attention, whether it's scholarships or some other thing. Um, it it could attract more attention, but this is going to be a new uh, experience for us anyway, right. doing it in season. Not on the Fourth of July, which was even hard for oh, me a, to get out there. It's a tough day. To it's a long. It's a long day. <laughs> and, and it really, it does. It makes for. Yeah. So this is a whole brand new opportunity, and we can probably revisit this after we experience one year of doing it See in February. It so we, we could always revisit. We should sure. Have more revenue off the rate. So you okay with that? You clear on that? I am. I'm very clear on it. We just say, let's get experience with this, and then we could uh, re thanks, Lou. We do a revisit. I actually have a couple other things there, too, because you brought it up when you were saying about specifically um, the 501c3s that we have. So there's two that we fund now or that are in the line items for it. One of them is Relay for Life. The other one is the Homeless Coalition Mayor's Ball. And those are two specific 501c3s that we fund, and those are the only two that we fund. Well, we don't fund, actually, we don't really fund them directly. The $1,000 that's in the budget is designated for our, we're going to field the team. We fill the village team every year mm -hmm. for the Relay for Life. I don't know what happened in past years. Somehow it got changed around a little bit, but that's the original concept, and that's kind of where we're going back to making sure that our team that we fund, and it's the, remember the Real Life for Life concept is any team that's part of it, the burden is on them to go out and raise funds for the organization that they're representing on behalf of them. So our team's job that we feel is to go out and try to raise funds for Real Life for Life. So it's not the village giving money directly to Real Life for Life, it's really supporting the team that we feel. Well, but we have <clears throat> residents and staff members that fund teams to other organizations. Sure. Right, so their line item's not on here as that far That has nothing to do with the village, though. There's individuals determining. But Relay for Life's not in the village anymore like it was before. I agree, it's, but we still fund, but we still fill the team. We, right, so we're, filling a, we're funding a team, or yeah. we're paying for a team to participate yeah. in a nonprofit group. But, but we're, we're not, not giving the money to the nonprofit. To. We're, we're funding our team to represent the village. So any team that's representing wanna, the village, we the can, so any team that's being funded by the village, I mean, anyone who's starting an organization that's um, finding a team to participate in another nonprofit, the f village will fund that team? No, we didn't, we didn't oh, say that. But that's what, well, that's what I'm asking. Well, what, other, what, other, what other situation do we have a team that we're funding? Susan G. Komen. We don't have a team, a formal team if, by if, the village. If we do. We so don't, another, though. So if we do, because that's the criteria for doing Relay for Life, so if we do, anyone can come in and say, I would like to have a Royal Palm Beach Village team. No, that's not how it works. That's not how it works, That's Selena. the point that I'm trying to make. Yeah, no, no, but you're trying to, you're creating, you're, you're making a comparison that's not valid. All right? The Relay for Life, uh, mm -hmm. let's go back, because you okay. already mentioned it. Years and years ago, the way Relay for Life operated was each city had their, hosted mm -hmm. their own Relay for Life. Mm -hmm. And organizations, 501c3s, they were all field teams. And because it was being hosted in the village, right, at the high school, we said, well, the village needs to support this by, host, by putting a team, fielding a team. And, and that's what we did. We, we said we put up $1,000 to give a base money for the team to come together and whatever expenses they had. They would, you know, buy food, whatever it is they needed right. to do. But the team goes out to raise the funds for Really for Life. All right, representing the village. So now, we have no other we have no other scenario where there's a 501c3 uh, activity where we actually fund uh, uh, put a village team out in place. So, but you're saying the door is open to do that? No, then. the door's not open. 
And, and Why do you want to open point. these doors? That's the, because that's the point that I'm trying to make, is you, no. have, you have one that we're funding, but so we're what, not funding what, the other. So what's your bottom line? You don't think we should have a Relay for Life team? I'm saying is if you're doing it for one, I'd like to do it for others. But we don't do it for others. There are no teams formed for others. So if there were teams for others, we would do it then? No. Okay. Okay, and then we have the mayor's ball that we, we fund that one for the whole. We don't fund the mayor's ball. We do. That's in the budget. No, Unless we, we just, don't. Did fund we take it out this year? Ball. No, it's in it's in there. Um, if a, the council chooses the council, to go right. and purchase tickets, right. in the we'll, council budget. we will pay for the the ticket and the and your significant other. Right, but or it's guests, just I should say. So it's just for the mayor's ball that goes towards funding for the homeless coalition. It doesn't we, go for any other budget, homeless coalition. We budget event. for the council and a guest to go to the mayor's ball. Yes. Right. So what's your question? We started doing We don't that. fund for any others, so there's okay. you know, lots of others. Where, what, we, we, we talked about this, if you recall, and the conversation was more about um, all of us on council being asked to attend some of these events mm -hmm. and represent the village. Okay? Right. Now, the mayor's ball is relatively new. In other words, it's only been in play about, I don't know, six years, something along that line. Five, six? Yeah, okay, I, I was right. And, and the, the, if you recall, the reason why the mayor's ball is structured the way it is, is it was inaugurated around the time when the new ethics rules went into place. And the new ethics rules changed all of the, the rules on how elected officials could represent themselves using their, their, uh, their title to raise funds for 501c3s. It kind of said, no, you can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the impetus of the mayor's ball then was then, okay, then we're gonna create an opportunity for the elected officials across the county to support a very worthy cause, that being the homeless co coalition. The homeless coalition. So that was the, that's how that came about. Now, so now you had the next issue. The next issue was it's a very expensive proposition to attend that ball, and it was uh, a bur it was becoming a burden for elected officials who wanted to support it. But and but so the conversation we had on this and the decision we made was predicated on um, funding events for uh, elected officials in the village to represent the village. All right, at these events. And the mayor's ball became a, a, a specific topic of discussion because the tickets are somewhat expensive. And we remember we debated it back and forth, back and forth, and we finally agreed, okay, then if one of our elected officials decided they wanted to attend, representing the village, mm -hmm. the village would cover that. But we don't cover everything that, that we attend. Right. No, we don't, and that yeah. that's and it went but into you, the whole. But I wouldn't account. You, you you're trying to characterize that as well. We're just giving funding for this particular cause, and that's not the case at all. That just happens to be what the mayor's ball is doing. We have no control over right. who the mayor's ball committee decides their funding for the first six years. They've been doing it for the homeless coalition. They could change that. We have no input well, to that. We have no Philistine, control over that. It's for the all right. Our decision is whether Center. or not we want to attend that event or not attend that event representing the village. So is it based on price then? Because we all, I believe, received an invitation then for the Compass where they're recognizing elected officials there in the work they're doing. So does that mean then we put this in the budget as? No, it doesn't mean that. Because we have other rules in the budget about when we get invited to attend certain right. things. If you get invited, if we get invited to attend and we're part of the program, that, that's a different rule that says, yeah, we're, we're there working, representing the village. But anywhere we go, we're representing the village. Yeah, well, we talked about that, remember? Yes, I did. And we, we kind of came to where we were. Now, that's another subject we could bring up the next year and see okay. how, do we want to modify that or expand it? So. All right. So those are the points I'd like to make in our budget that I've brought up the last three years as well. So, thanks. And I'm... Richard, go ahead. I'm yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm still back on the golf tournament. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, We're just, on the tenth tee now. <laughs> just, just, just one of the comments that that the mayor made, and, and and a thought I had when he made the comment was, okay, we have uh, a line item budget for ten thousand, and let's just say we're extremely optimistic, and we do end up getting fifteen thousand dollars, clear and above. I would suggest we do fifteen scholarships that year instead of having it roll over um, to the next year to fund the scholarship since it's already in the budget anyway, and I would like to provide more scholarship activities if it's funded by the tournament, not 
as you said, putting more tax dollars up for that and, w w and go year to year. Um, that just, In other words, that thought. If I understand what you just said, let's say this, let's say this February we net 15 grand. Right. So that's 10 grand that pays for this year's. Mm -hmm. So that's five grand we're ahead going into next year. Right. So you're suggesting the next year we, we do 15. 15? We do 15 when we get that what? money. But if we don't hit that money, then of course we don't use it that year that we've brought it in. It's, it's right. just my thought. Okay, I don't know how the logistics and timing of that works out, but if it works out. And if it doesn't, then like you said, it'll okay. roll You'll over to the next year if we can. You'll yeah. know in three months by the end I think it's, No, I think it's reasonable if this becomes a success that Lou thinks it's going to be in the, from the long term. It's a, that, it's a good at, idea. At the end of the day, the winner becomes we can get we can fund more scholarships right. and, and we're not and we're not spending taxpayer dollars. No, Correct. and that's and it's it's a it's that's a reasonable. good idea. That's and reasonable. the other thought is though yeah. is that because it's only benefiting Let's, high school seniors and not the thousands of students that we have in the village, which is if we did give the excess funds to the PTO of all the right. schools, it could benefit buying supplies for others. So that was the point. Jeff. Sure. So I, I think it's a good idea to to consider what Richard was, was just saying. Um, if, if it turns out that there is uh, a significant amount of additional revenue generated by it, I think that's great. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of associating something like a scholarship with that because I do think it makes it more attractive. Uh, and, um, and so it could be a win-win all the way around. So I, I think these are some good ideas. And as far as looking for some kind of broader application to more of the schools in the future, at least next strategic planning session, let's have that conversation again, because I, I think that's worthwhile considering as well. So, thank you. Any other? Yeah, I'll just add my two cents. Go ahead, um, three I, cents, I want three cents. Three, okay. Um, I, I like Richard's suggestion. I think that if we do have over, then it can be applied to scholarships in that same year. Um, I'd like to talk about Relay for Life for just one more moment. It, I understand where the roots were. I understand where the context started. Um, but since it's changed, I think Selena brings up a very good point. It's not in the village anymore. And I would either like us to consider to not fund them, not that they're not a great organization, but let's be consistent with um, other nonprofits coming forward. And it's really hard to say, no, we're not going to support you when this organization of Relay for Life isn't in the village anymore. So you're suggesting that we no longer fill the team? Because they're not in the village, so don't we should pull out completely. You're saying mm -hmm. have no, nothing to do with it. Because there's there's there are many more nonprofit organizations. Oh, I get it. I get who, it. Who we all okay. philosophically could agree that we should support, and we don't. Jeff. So most of the team, actually all of the teams that I know of, with perhaps the exception of our team, really are pure volunteers. Total, 100%. Um, my guess is, knowing most of the members of our team who have shown up for year to year, they'd probably do it anyway. And insofar as support to the actual event itself, um, I know that uh, other municipalities contribute in other ways. Um, I, you know, I, for example, the stage that is put there is Wellington stage. So maybe there's some other way <laughs> that we could contribute other than uh, the, the funding as, as a way of looking at this, but certainly doing what we can to encourage a continuation of the support through the teams and that, and that type of stuff. You're smiling. I'm smiling because you're saying something completely opposite to what Jan is saying. Jan is saying what? Pull, out. pull out. Pull out. Well, You're suggesting well, so supporting it in a different way. In so a let different me try way. to be clear. No, no. That's, okay. I'm just so let me, let me restate <laughs> it. I don't think you need $1,000 to have a team from Royal Palm Beach. Well, I was going to say to you, the members from Royal Palm Beach, uh, the team, do volunteer their time. They don't get paid to do that. Sure, and I don't want to indicate right. that. No, no. The funding not. is, there, there, there's some costs to put together a team, and, and they, when they, they go out there, they do a setup, they provide food. Uh, you know, this, the point here is for the team to have covered their, those expenses, because you don't want them to have to spend, they can't spend money they're collecting. All right, for really for life. All that has to go directly through. So there was nothing there, right? And then I, just, just so you know, behind the scenes, any organization that you see that fields a team, they'll get, they're, they're supported by the organization that they're representing in some way, shape, and form to, to make it happen. But every, all the people, the time they put in, it's all volunteer time. And just to clarify, the, the team doesn't use the money for anything. They, it is donated 
in in the name of the team in Royal Palm Beach, but it, it to a nonprofit. No, it's it's when the team signs up and and they they do their fundraising. They do a lot of different. They do a lot of fundraising that month before the event, right. and um, and it and that along with the thousand dollars is given to the to the Cancer Society for the Relay for Life for. So it it does it. Yeah, it it goes it, it goes to them. It goes to it goes to the organization along with everything else that, that that the Royal Palm Beach team that Rob Hill has been heading up for the last 10, 10 years. Yeah, 15. 15, 15 years. Yeah, um, yeah. That's so right. I mean, it, and that's it's just added to the the total dollar amount. I don't know the total dollar amount that the the rest of what they raise. Um, I've heard there's numbers, but I can't remember right now. Yeah, maybe. The, Ray, if that's true, yeah. then then what Jan is saying is correct. That is, See, I was under the that impression is, that we that was funding the team, not it's, being it's in it's their not name. Like writing a check to to relay for life. It's writing a check to the team, but the team yeah, takes right. the money or whatever they need and yeah. gives that to well, the relay for life if they can. I just to clarify a little bit, yeah. the donation is exactly how Ray Ray said. It never comes to the team. It goes right to the American Cancer Society. It goes into our fundraising effort which we raise somewhere around five or $6,000 as a team. It doesn't buy ribbons or you know, any, any of that. All of those efforts, whether it's cooking breakfast or anything else, comes from us and we turn that dollar into two and we turn that $2 into there. And I would just challenge, I'd love to see other nonprofits do what the American Cancer Society does because when we're out there on that field, every school is out there, is, is, is a, it has teams out there. Businesses are out there. It is the biggest charity fundraiser of the Western communities. Okay, I have yet to see any other nonprofit, and I know they've got the best of intentions, but I've never seen them mobilize a community the way the American Cancer Society does for the Relay for Life. And that's why I'm involved with it. You know, I've looked at their margin, their ratio of what they spend. 12%. It's within what I think is comfortable that I can represent. And when we spend the times and go to the schools, we have everybody out here. It's not just a nonprofit out there. We have citizens we have students learning about volunteerism and we're fighting cancer so i mean i think it's an admirable cause i understand the position that you're in but to compare a community effort of the largest charity event of the western communities the relay for life to whatever you want to compare it to is like apples to oranges it's not the same because it's not just the money it's the involvement of the community and thank you for a minute to be able to stand up. Thanks, thank you. Well, well said. Any questions about anything while we're mm -hmm. no, no, I appreciate it, Rob. Thanks for the update. I don't know who was next. You or Jeff? Oh, I'm. Oh, okay. Sweet. Good. I, the only thing I was going to say is that the criteria is like how Mr. Hill came in and presented. If we had others that had uh, teams that were representing the village, that we would do that for them as well. I'm not saying don't take the money away from them or for the cause. I'm saying is you, you need to figure out is because there's several others that get together and do the same thing and would like to have a team and would like the funding as well. Yeah, but a team representing the village is not a team ad hoc out there for some other organization. Village employees. Right, this is village well, employees. So, right, so it's village employees. So we have lots of village employees that are involved in lots of nonprofits. And, to and we're not going to get, we're not going down that rabbit hole of starting to look at representing every nonprofit. That's, we're not going to do that. That's just a policy. So you're going to tell one staff member we're supporting you, but not the other. Yeah. Okay. That was my, thank you. Yeah. I have not heard it from a staff. Have you had requests from staff to support other no, endeavors that they're involved in? I haven't heard any. All well, I'm saying is if we're doing it for one, that we can open it up to the others. Well, I hear you, and I understand the point. And if somebody comes up with that, maybe we'll cross the bridge there. Does that okay. make sense? Yes. Okay? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> point made. So we're going to stay where we are? Okay. For the time being. All right. So now that we... Village manager's budget on page yeah, that's 38. Long. Well, that was easy. <laughs> We've reduced this budget Let's considerably. Let's get to the million dollar issues. <laughs> Tightened our belt, reduced cost, and we don't have the $300,000 payment to the TPA this year. <laughs> we had that in the budget oh, last year. Because so, it rolls, right? It, well, it's one pay, it's a, it was a one payment what? to them to get them up right. and running so, as an independent but we said thing. don't keep giving it It back. was out of my budget last year. That's okay. why the reduction this year. When do we get the 2%? Um, we, we get a bill for that. <laughs> when do we get, that's a good question. That was, 
We pay that once a year, and the first payment oh, is, no. is they coming pay us. I mean, they pay us, and right. we decided and, not to do that since the beginning. Of the right. Okay. There was some conflict in the wording on it, it when it of when it started, and I knew there was. Yeah, I thought we had got it. so we got it resolved. Yep, I knew we got it resolved. Confusing around the wording on that. Okay. Everything else. And my budget is the same with the exception of uh, election expenses. We did increase that line item uh, for anticipated special election. If you remember, we had some conversations on, well, we're, it doesn't look like we'll do the special election now, but we still are looking at, at doing something um, sometime in the future. I don't remember the exact dates, but uh, we, we have two things out there that we're going to need council direction on, and that is the um, term lengths and the Tax abatement. Tax abatement. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know the exact date, but we've got an inc we've increased that line on them in in the event that if we choose to do that. That's the only changes in the village manager's budget. The next budget is legal. The actual budget amount is less. The way that that budget works is if if there is an increase, it's most likely because of uh, development or more development. Well, make an emergency. And. Um, and it, it, development uh, expenses are reimbursed by the developers. So, and then the, the next one, uh, oh, legal was on page 52, I'm sorry. Yeah, and then on page 50, well, what we did is the, all the ones that I was handling, we put on the agenda in order, and then, and then we have HR number five. Um, on page 54 is the police contract. Uh, the police contract, uh, came in at 2% increase. Um, they originally had discussions of 3%. We did 3% last year. Um, the sheriff uh, did choose to, to, to charge us 2%. Uh, we appreciate that, and, and uh, that's what's included in the police budget. The next one on the agenda is finance. No. Wait a minute, I'm sorry, human resources. Page 40. Page 40. Go ahead. Vice Mayor. Please. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. <laughs> My budget really doesn't make any significant that. changes. We are going out to bid for a new CPA for our, we just say, safety and need. <clears throat> we'll impact the numbers, so that's up in the air. And we look, we look for this to answer. Monica, is your microphone? Now it is. <laughs> no. <laughs> Are there any questions I can answer? <laughs> Hang on a second. We're transferring you. <clears throat> I had a little, what I thought was an emergency turned out to be a false alarm. So that's two tonight, right? Yeah. Okay. So Mon Monica was saying. I'm sorry, Monica. <laughs> Did I interrupt you? <laughs> I was just saying there's no significant changes. We're going out to bid. We expect the number to come back to be a savings in the switch of the, uh, the new bank that will be hosting um, our HSA, HRA, and FSA accounts. And if you don't have any questions for me. A savings in terms of cost to the village or savings? Yes, savings oh, okay. in cost to the village to um, the maintenance of the accounts. Okay. And better customer service. <laughs> it's even better. It's even yeah. better. Page 40. Got it. Thanks. Are there no questions? no questions? No questions? Thanks, Monica. Thank you. Thank you. Planning department's next. Good evening, Council. Um, what we have here on page 42 is a breakdown of planning and zoning's budget. Um, over the past years, we've had a status quo budget. One of the differences that you'll see in this budget this year is for um, professional services. Um, we have included um, monies there to, um, for an arborist and a landscape architect services to help our citizens in our um, commercial properties um, as we go out to uh, try to 
um, help those commercial properties come up to their approved landscape plan, or if there's any deviations to that approved landscape plan, help them work it through our process in order to make them compliant. And if the case may be, um, we'll be bringing those in front of our council. Um, <clears throat> also, as part of that 100,000 is for land planning services. Um, these land planning services, I experienced a situation where I had lost half of my staff. <laughs> Ray, um, I have to give thanks to Ray, he gave me the tools that I needed in order to succeed through those times. And so this now is to have that in place in case something like that occurs again, uh, in order to um, relieve some of that pressure and have somebody um, come on board to help us out through that time period. Uh, other than that, there's this is a status quo budget, um, and I'll make myself available to answer any questions. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, I'm back. Page 47. There's a major change to the finance budget this year. We have removed information services personnel and cost, and that's being created as their own department, which is on page 51. So we transferred four people from finance information systems division to information systems uh, department and we're adding an additional information system specialist. Additionally, we're, as I alluded to in the summary, uh, promoting the information systems manager to an information systems director to run the department. The other additional costs that are associated with any increases this year are in information systems, <clears throat> the maintenance costs associated with project docs hosting, as well as uh, Florida captioning service for word transcription of speech to text or archive videos. The two of those alone were $140,000. So those items is what's increasing my budget this year. Other than that, nothing. <clears throat> it, it all remains the same. Any questions? Right. Paul now. Or okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to non-departmental now on page 81. What, what page? 81. 81. 81. 81. The budget remains pretty static. It increased by 1.29 percent. Other than that, these items are just they, they leveled off. there's any questions on that. These are the communications and postage for the village, as well as the village utilities, as well as all the insurance for the village. And as I said, the increase is nil. And there are no questions on that. Community development is up next. Okay. Any questions? No questions? Thanks, Dan. Community developments on page 56. Take a brief look at that. You'll see our structure there. Uh, we're not adding or changing any personnel right now. Over on page 58, you'll see our mission statement there. It ties into our strategic plan with our e-permitting and hopes of being able to develop more complex uh, metrics to really measure our service delivery. And uh, as hard as that is, and it's going to be a major task that will <coughs> involve all of us at some point, uh, we're very much looking forward to it. 
And uh, those of you that have been through my office and my department see how we're shuffling papers constantly. Um, but one of the high, high points of the, uh, of the department this year, and as I stood here last year, and I threw these numbers out and I thought, wow, I don't know if we're really gonna hit those. But if you see those single family homes, uh, we're gonna reach that $77 million valuation mark. And not only is that for this year, but we're forecasting just about the same year coming up. So we're having two very big years right there at community development and, uh, and the growth, as, as we've mentioned, uh, if you total up here, it's just uh, over $100 million of, uh, of valuation for each year. So it's, uh, things are going well. Budget-wise, uh, we've just uh, kind of held the line with some things. We know we're gonna make some changes, but we did have to bump up uh, some of the other services with the Arborist. For to, to be able to make those determinations as the applications come in and some inspections and code enforcement. But other than that, the building division uh, is pretty much staying the same. Our overall budget, as you might have seen on the first page, is uh, increasing at uh, less than 1%, 0.66. Uh, so then we go to code enforcement, and again, uh, we've just had to increase slightly some of our training numbers uh, as we try to do just that, educate ourselves more, and spend more you know, time educating our, our public with the, with the landscaping pri primarily right now. Um, we are going to proceed. We're, we do anticipate being involved with some more kind of outreach programs as we get closer to the e-permitting. And right now, I don't think it's going to be any kind of number that, that needs to be adjusted in the budget, but we'll have something uh, for, for next year as we, uh, as we go through this initial learning process. But other than that, I think we're in good shape um, with building and code enforcement and business tax. And if you have any questions on there, I'll, I'll answer them for you. Real quick, thank you very much for you and your staff because I know with the new um, tree policy that it's kind of confusing, but the staff has been great about going out to the HOAs and talking to them and helping them out with that. And I don't know if this is a question for you or for the village manager, but do you know when you anticipate the renovations to the building to your department? The lobby improvements? Lobby, correct. Well, I just got the uh, contracts back today that are signed. Uh, they've got to make one small change to an insurance policy that was caught by our attorney. They'll be on Ray's desk. I'm in touch with the contractor. I'm hoping to finish that uh, by the end of this year. Okay. So, you know, September, August, right there. So, so those finance people can't quite hold me to that, but, uh, <laughs> but it should happen very quickly. Thank you for asking. I just, it's not a really a budget question, but in general, um, I was looking at the number of cases that you, you process and you're looking at about the same number of cases. Overall, are you finding uh, our residents, when they get involved with uh, having to make a correction, um, doing it in a willing way or you get pushback? Uh, for the most part, it's, it's pretty standard. Uh, we have to work through the uh, constitutional kind of rights, you know, series. This is my ownership and I want to do, and we have to explain these guidelines and how we're protecting property values. And when we get through that, I, I think people start to realize that uh, mowing their grass and putting their garbage cans out of view is a, is a good thing for everybody. So I'd say they, they do it more voluntarily. And that's, that's really reflective of the number of courtesy notices that we issue compared to the numbers that reach violence. That's, so, okay. And uh, our, our magistrate does a good job up there uh, taking in and making decisions on, on what is reasonable uh, for, our, for our residents and our guidelines that are in place, Mr. Mayor. Okay, good. Any other questions? You wanna add something, Ray? You know, I've, if you go to a code enforcement hearing and, and see how they go through it and, and the detail and the, the crossing the T's and dotting the I's, and it, it, it is impressive. And, and it, it, is, it is so needed. Um, it's amazing, you know, when you watch that process and, and everybody is so professional in that process and, and it's important. I mean, we had, a, we had one, one owner, one, one business that was fined $5,000 a day for not um, closing his business. He opened a business without any, uh, any, any permits or any licenses and, and took a little while to shut down. <laughs> the magistrate was very clear with them that Rob's uh, code enforcement officers did a, a great case putting it together, and um, and that business is shut down, and it's not one that we wanted open. 
So it, it, it's very well needed and, and very much makes a difference in the community. Okay. We got to give a shout out to Linda Walker. She's our yeah, she's superintendent. She does a great job for us. Lead blocker, Linda Walker. Okay. <laughs> Are you no heard, questions? Heard what you said. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Appreciate Rob. it. All right, you're going to talk about engineering. <laughs> I hope. Item 11. If you want to go to, to uh, Where are page we? 65. <clears throat> And the, the significant changes that we had is, is we, we are looking at, at transitioning the GIS coordinator to a GIS manager position. Uh, Jeff's been with us for a dozen years. When he started, uh, GIS was, was probably a little bit simpler of a, of a process, but it was, it was really an inventory-based uh, software. It's evolved to much more than that. Uh, it, along with that, we, he was instrumental in developing our CRS program. Uh, actually, FEMA relied on Jeff to, to reconfigure the maps. If you remember the, the initial maps that came out and the process that we went through in, in, in uh, making the maps more realistic for, for what the, the flooding was in the village, Jeff was instrumental in doing that. Uh, so obviously, we, we want to reward him for, for those efforts. And, and not only does he do that, he is, is, has additional employees, which, which is another change that we're looking at, at uh, bringing on is another uh, tech position to, to help the Parks and Recs Department, Community Development, and, and other departments with, with support, uh, because there are some great tools that come out of the, the ESRI software, and uh, Jeff is an expert at it, and he's a very valuable person to our organization. So, uh, the, the other major changes is the mobility study. There's an additional $50,000 in my professional services uh, to, to look at the mobility for this, for this village. As we look at the, the issues as it relates to congestion uh, and options to the, to the, towards the future. Um, I think that, that's about it as it relates to changes. Just real quick, as technology changes, and I know that you're ahead of the game on that, do you find that um, it's, there are trainings out there for our staff to be qualified to use that, or do you think you're going to have to out, go outside to hire as the technology changes for that, especially with the mapping? Uh, well, the, the back end side of it, we're going to need experts. But, but the good news is, is technology is making it easier for day-to-day -day people. Right. Uh, if you look at Paul's group, they're out there with iPads. Yeah. Uh, we have the majority <laughs> of our infrastructure mapped. So when, when they go and do maintenance on something, they're able to click on that, talk about what they did, and then we get to see a, a log over time for that. So it's, it's a tremendous tool as it relates to seeing if, if something's failing consistently over time, hey, let's fix it. Let's, let's spend the money and replace this rather than continue to throw, throw money into something that, that fails over time. So, and and every, every department is, is going to need these types of things. Lou has to do inspections on his playgrounds to make sure that they're being maintained and they're safe. So we, we could develop tools for that. When it comes to emergency management, we have, obviously we have to, to collect damage assessments. So there, there's just, uh, there, there's a lot of things that need to be developed, and, and obviously that's the idea behind bringing on another technician to, to assist us in doing that and, and roll these out and, and make us more efficient. And bring the staff along with that. Correct. Okay. And I mean, the, the ESR software is, I mean, they're, they're the biggest in, in the industry. Um, they're the best in the industry. They've been around for close to 30 years now. Um, they took a different approach than everybody else 30 years ago. That, that set them up to be the position they're in today. Uh, and that was not relying on many people back then were, were knowing they needed to go to databases, but they were, they were taking an engineering solution and, and, and using mapping software to do that. And it, and it just wasn't the right way. This is a database. This isn't a, a mapping um, solution. It, it, it depicts a map, it draws maps and it depicts the maps of the data that's there, but it is a database. And they are, are all of our employees, they get to go to user conference. Um, ESRI has a very, very large um, user group. They are very good at, at, at coming up with applications and, and responsive to the, 
to all their, their clients out there and creating um, applications. Whenever we're looking for an application ad, I mean, obviously we have, we have options. We have IS and we have theirs and we have, and we have GIS. I think what you're going to see in the future is many of our solutions um, being on the GIS platform. Uh, it's just easier to easier to, to deal with, easier to put on, and ninety percent of what we deal with is geographically located. So that 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 is going forward, and we and we're in a we're in an excellent position where all of our departments have had it long enough and exposed to it long enough that that they it's getting to be their tool. It's not something that we just put somebody in their department and that one person uses. This is something that, that <coughs> everybody in the organization. Um, Will will have their have access to and and be neat and learn how to use. So so you answered one of my questions, which is given the um, the rapidity of which uh, these uh, software applications grow and develop and that kind of thing. Um, are, are we sending people to conferences to, to keep them exposed? And so I heard you say yes, yes, we are definitely. And that's that's actually in the budget to send them to the ESRI conference this year. He goes every other year. He goes to the conference, so, and and they do, there's local training for that. So uh, yes, we, uh, that's 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 really critical. And of course, bringing on additional uh, technician is really going to help tremendously in that area. And the fact that the CRS um, was driven so positively and so quickly and so efficiently to a quick level of um, of actual offsetting the, the, the cost of those that insurance that those who are in a flood, flood zone actually will have to acquire. I mean, that's what CRS is all about, is to uh, give a reduction and justification for the reduction of the, the cost of flood insurance. And the fact that you can figure it out by going online and putting your address in and seeing whether you're inside or outside in one of those flood zones, it's all about that GIS, and that's really good stuff. It, it really is, so that, that's an exciting piece. Uh, but it, absolutely. When, it, when I got trained as a floodplain manager, we actually had to go to, to maps, and they had scales on that because everything was paper-based, and, and that wasn't very long ago. So this, this <laughs> digitized map, I mean, and obviously that's when FEMA came to us, that's what they were looking to do is, is to roll out the digital maps. And Go ahead. Sorry. Are they, are they starting to use the satellite feeds for updates? The, excuse me? Are they using satellite feeds for the updates? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the, the aerial imagery is actually a separate layer, so you could you could update that as often as you want. Whereas the, the FEMA map is is really just the the flood zones delineated okay. over Good. the top of that. So. One other question: uh, uh, mobility study. Uh, are we going out house to do that? Out of house to do that? Absolutely. Okay, and how, and, how and I've been working with the TPA on on getting some, some names that were out there for that. And fantastic. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Any questions? All right, thanks, Chris. Paul, you're up. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mayor, Mayor Council. Um, the Public Works budget actually starts on page 67 uh, with our organizational chart, and I'm just going to piggyback off the discussion we just had on GIS. Part of that funding for uh, one of those texts is out of uh, my operating budget and the stormwater budget. And uh, our goal in my department is that every single thing that we do will be tracked through that GIS system. Uh, I have field crews that don't leave the yard without their iPads. Um, so it's an extremely important tool to us now. And uh, Chris's uh, guys, Jeff and all them, do an absolutely wonderful job. So uh, the only other thing I say about the organizational charge is the asterisk uh, employees there are the ones that are included as part of the stormwater utility budget, which I'll be speaking to after this one. If you look on page 70, uh, our performance, you can find our performance workload indicators. And uh, th this budget that I present to you this evening is a status quo budget. There are no, uh, no service level changes, no major budget changes uh, to this budget. Uh, the actual uh, budget is shown on page 71. And uh, the, the Bottom line number there is a 1.1% increase over the uh, adopted uh, fiscal year 2019 budget. Uh, the ma vast majority, well, just about all of the increase in this budget is due to personal services, and that's really all I have to say, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Just one quick question about the street lights. Mm -hmm. Do the new street lights we're putting up on along Okeechobee Boulevard 
fall under you? Uh, the, the one, there, a portion of them will be maintained by the village uh, after it gets constructed, and a portion of them be, will be maintained by FPL. Really? Yes, sir. How do we divide that up? <laughs> uh, it just depends on where they were and that, uh, where, where the located? light was, was put. As okay. To, All right. The lights that are put on existing poles will be, con will be maintained by FPL. Yeah. Right. The they won't let us get on their poles to maintain them. <laughs> Well, it's FPL. Okay, I get it. <laughs> but okay. uh, yeah, the, the, those will become under our jurisdiction. I, I've Good gotten question. more feedback from folks Good about question. that. At the, Who do I go to? Oh, yeah. At the store. Well, the good news. Sometimes we get a call or, uh, or an email saying the light is out. And as soon as we let you guys know, they, you know, I get a call back saying, "Hey, they got, they fixed it. It's working." So that's good. But no, I've got a lot of positive feedback about the new lights that we're putting up along Okeechobee. So that's that. I'm glad. You know, it took a while to get that project, but you got the money for it, and now we're moving forward with that. Good. Uh, I don't see any lights. Any questions? Comments? Okay. Thanks, Paul. Uh, we can move to the stormwater utility budget. And that uh, starts on page 86. Uh, with the organizational chart, you'll see it's the same chart from the, uh, from the Polar Works uh, operating budget. Uh, with the asterisk employees, the ones that are, are covered under this. Uh, so the asterisk employees are the ones that are in this budget? Correct, and that are accounted for in the personal services part okay. of this budget, yes. Uh, the uh, performance, workload in, performance workload indicators are on page 88. And again, this is a status quo budget as well. There are no major budget changes or any service level changes in this budget. Um, the uh, Expenditure breakdown is on page 89, and uh, the uh, bottom line number of this represents a 9% increase from the adopted budget uh, for fiscal year 2019. And again, uh, the majority of those uh, increases are due to personal services. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Looks like well, <clears throat> the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the extra effort and and resource allocation. That was made last year to address the the canal situation is bearing fruit. No. Yes. Okay, you can add to that if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I gave you an opening here. <laughs> Help me here. Come on. No, because it was a, it was a topic that we had. Some of our citizens were very concerned about, and we did respond and, and react to it. And so far, we, we seem to be in a better place than we were a year ago today. Uh, we are in a much better okay. place. So. The only issue that we have out there currently is with, uh, uh, it's a form of algae, it's a rooted algae, it's a native plant to Florida, Cara. It's also uh, called muskgrass. Um, and for, for whatever reason, we're getting, uh, we're having a hard time getting it to drop out. The treatments that they're using are appropriate treatments, but they'll just have to continue to treat it uh, through the month to get it. To and they're not out. using any treatments that's harmful to the environment or harmful no, sir. to Every, the everything, wildlife. Everything is done uh, in accordance with the label. The label in, in the uh, application of herbicides and pesticides, the label is the law, and they, and they uh, conform okay. with the label. Good. Any Can questions? Look good? Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Parks and Recreation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, hey, Lou. Sorry about that. They keep telling me, keep it short. <laughs> but you got to show up. So much good stuff. We have a lot of parks. That's funny. Okay. Um, the budget for Parks and Rec starts on uh, page 72 is the organizational chart. And uh, just to update you that you know, we, as far as personnel, we're making two part-time facility attendants to full-time. And the reason for that is, you know, the seniors now are permanently at the rec center. And along with that, we have uh, a number of rentals church groups and organizations that are renting at the at the rec center because they didn't want to they didn't want to go back to the cultural center so we picked that up so we needed that extra okay, that works, no? personnel 
Uh, on page 75 is the parts division, and there's really no major changes. But if you have any questions on it, I'll be glad to answer. So you're saying your operational costs for maintenance of all of these parks is holding online? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, some of the athletic facilities now are getting pretty worn, but uh, that's just the overuse that we have. And we're starting to shut them down now and keeping them closed for up to eight weeks and keeping everybody off. And if you notice, you go to Seminole Palms Park, you notice that it's all fenced off because we just can't keep up with the demand. Okay. On page 77 is the uh, recreation <coughs> division. And again, there, uh, there aren't, isn't anything uh, significant. Uh, if you go to um, the senior transportation, obviously we have the, the dollars in there. In the arts program, you see a major reduction there, um, the arts and crafts program, which included the pre-K program. And as you know, we're going to a licensed facility. So we had to, we had shut that down uh, back in October. So that, that program didn't run at all. Um, and the expenses now are gonna be reduced because that contractor who's gonna be running that those pre-K classes will be paying us instead of where we took, uh, we would pay them less 30%. They're actually gonna take the registrations, they're gonna be responsible for keeping all the records because we really didn't wanna get involved in that um, and then they will pay us 30% okay. uh, of the revenues. So we've cut those expenses out. And then you go down to 5222 under commodities, which is athletic programs. We are taking over, taking back the uh, youth flag football program. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't very successful. They're finding it difficult. So we, uh, we had given it that to them because they wanted to tie it in with their other football program. It's just not. Just not working out. Now, now that's the who, who this was the part one part Warner group? Yes. Yeah. All right. So they, they're giving that back. Yes. What was the problem? This... Well, you know, you you get the coaches out there and they're more interested in the tackle program. Okay. And that's what they were counting on, that they would take over the you know, coach the the flag football during the off season. They just weren't interested. Okay. You know, so we're we're going to take it back, and when we had it, it was it was pretty successful. It was a great, yeah, it was yeah. robust program. A lot of a lot of participants. Okay. The uh, cultural division um, changes in the cultural division. Uh, if you look, other contract services on thirty four ninety. Um, basically, we've we've added a lot. Um, the arts and crafts. Oh, I'm sorry. The um, New programs and amenities for the special special events. Um, if you go to 5224, which is the arts and crafts program, that's uh, 32,000, and there is for the art program that we had in strategic plan. Uh, the 32,000 we come up with that because it's one percent of the construction cost of the cultural center. And what, we're, what we were planning on was putting uh, paintings inside the cultural center. I'm sorry. What, you what, deem if you want something else. What line item was that? Page 79. If you go down to oh, 5224, okay. page 79. Got it. Okay. And if you have any other suggestions for the art program, by all means, let us know. I guess what we're just what we're doing with the what the arts program is, although that project preceded our new ordinance on that, in, in the spirit of of being part of that program, we're going back and retrofitting and saying we're going to now allocate those funds and do that as if that program was in place before we we did the right. project. So, okay, and we'll go we'll go through our normal process, the P and Z right. role they play in. Correct. Correct. Okay. 
Any thoughts on that? Um, and then, okay. you know, going with the cultural center again, I mean, because it was closed for over a year, um, but to try to market it, uh, we're getting involved in with some memberships in different different areas. Uh, there's a there's a organization called the Wedding Wire, whereby actually it'll give us leads and we'll be able to put our information out there so people who are looking to get married it actually lists all the facilities that are available and that's going to help us tremendously and also the uh, meeting.com which is another uh, area that we want to get involved in we're going to become members of and again they list out what facilities are available for conferences and what's available for uh, meetings. And then uh, getting in with the local hotels, because the hotels, which we've already talked to a couple of them, they they're, uh, don't have the room for different activities. And we just want to let them know that we're available and we're giving them a, a, a brochure. And along with that, we'll be having a, uh, a virtual tour which you've seen the one that we had for the uh, Commons Park. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be doing the same thing for, for the Cultural Center and put that online and on Facebook so everybody will be able to see it and promote that facility. Has the uh, utilization rate reached levels that it was previously, or do you have a feel for that? I would, I would say um, number-wise, no. Dollar-wise, we've exceeded our previous years. Well, we had higher prices. <laughs> that's exactly right. But it's a, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a quality facility, and people that are coming there, I just, they're loving it. They're loving it. And so it, it'll only grow. It'll, I was going to say, so it's going to grow. OK. Correct. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Uh, do you or Ray want to talk a little bit more about the senior ride program that we have allocated funds for? Oh, the senior, senior transportation? Yeah. Okay. Um, we've been in touch, and unfortunately, I haven't been here for a few weeks, but um, we've been in touch with Lyft. Uh, we've been in touch with Uber. And we have another organization that's called PAPA, P-A-P-A, -P -A, um, PAPA. which we've, we're actually setting up a meeting uh, next week with them. We're finding out through some of the seniors that have used these programs between Lyft and, and Uber that they have issues with them. And uh, we're trying to weed it out what, what the issues are. Um, one of them is that's come up is that Uber has a, a price. And then if you have a, uh, a gift card, it's a different price. Um, Lower or so, higher? So, uh, higher. Okay. So that's what we want to find out is that's how this is how this is happening. Yeah. Uh, and actually, if you go online, you you you'll see some of the some of the issues. Um, also, it's I mean these these gift cards you can get them at almost any store now. You can get them at CVS, Walgreens, Walmart. Um, so we're we're looking in that and see how that can can possibly benefit us and if we can get a discount uh, gift on, cards. The, on the gift cards. Um, I did get rates from uh, this other organization <clears throat> and uh, they're pretty reasonable and uh, I'm going to be sitting down with the manager and we're setting up a meeting with them uh, to see what, what they have to, to offer. In addition to transportation, they also offer, you know, home care. Uh, you know, where they'll sit down and just socialize with you. This, this is the PAPA? This is the PAPA. Okay. Yeah. Um, so again, we'll be, we'll be meeting with them and hopefully we can get this program going within the next 30 days or so. And what we're proposing for it is that we do a monthly smartphone training. We use uh, students from the high school that, that train our seniors. I mean, we don't, we're not doing it during the summer, but when September kicks back up, we'll, we'll start it back up. And, um, and any, any senior, 65 or older, lives in Royal Palm Beach, attends one of those 
smartphone classes, uh, we want to give them a, a, a gift card of $40 and, and give them an opportunity. They can come once a year. So, every so that's, year. What we're, that's what we're... You show up every year and get their... To get their the gift, gift card, card. Right. right. And and then get, get sat down with somebody, set it up on their phone, teach them how to use it, and hopefully expose them to the service. Okay. And uh, one other thing is, is the, uh, and I was, the, the, the PAPA program is, they don't have to have a smartphone. All they have to do is pick up their phone or have a flip phone. Really? It'd be easier for some people. And, you know, we'll look at the pluses and pluses and minuses of the programs and get it going. Great. Good. I'm sure people are waiting for that. <clears throat> yeah. Anything else? That's it. Yeah. Any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah, I just have a couple of real quick. The and you were talking about the fields before and the overuse, but now that we have, aren't there additional baseball, softball teams that are looking to use it, or the travel teams want to come play here more? Do you find that we're over? Are we able to accommodate them, or you find that we have to put them away? Okay. If they're, uh, the travel teams have to be associated and registered with our provider. Right. Right. We don't take them from anywhere else. They have to be associated with our provider. And I know that they were talking about, I think there was girl softball was talking about starting another team or, I mean, are we able to accommodate them or? Yeah, the girls softball, you know, the travel, mm -hmm. they will end up, they will play at uh, Farron. Okay. Um, right now, the regular program, the recreational program, they're playing at uh, Bob Marcello mm -hmm. because they get more exposure. Okay. okay. We're, we're trying to get, get it grown. It's, that the girls softball program is it's it's suffering um but it's suffering all over it's not just here because uh, everybody's going to travel mm -hmm. girls travel uh, baseball you know baseball is holding their own of about 500 kids soccer we're over 600 uh in soccer plus their travel um, but the, the baseball fields and the softball fields is not the issue as far as overuse, uh, as far as maintenance goes. It's, it's those soccer fields and, you know, those multi-purpose fields that get tore up. And, I mean, we just resodded uh, two fields at Seminole, and it's unbelievable. You'd never know we did it. Yeah. And it takes the three weeks to catch anyway, so I know it takes time oh, yeah, for that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do and the other question I had then was with the surtax money that we have. I know you talked in the past about doing certain renovations and lighting upgrades and things like that. Do you find that it's the budget that we have set for that is working for you or? Well, we're able to we're able to resod. I mean, we have to go in every year and, and resod parts of it, not not the the entire field. Um, every seven eight years you're going to have to just tear it right down and redo it. Um, and if you look in the future, I mean, looking at uh, artificial turf, mm. it's everybody's going to it. The prices are coming down. Uh, and the technology no, no downtime. has improved too, though, for yeah. artificial turf. So. Yeah. No, no downtime. Uh, maintenance is non-existent. So... So how, how how far down in our future do you foresee that? You can you can do a field for about six hundred. Hmm. One field. That's probably worthwhile considering it sooner. Yeah. Bring it. <laughs> so speak, yeah. speaking of maintenance and and ball fields or uh, sports fields, um, probably an apples app, apples oranges here, but. Um, which is more expensive? Is it is it more expensive to maintain our athletic fields or our parks, where they aren't? Depends combined? on the park. I'm sorry. It would depend on the. See, park. I knew you were going to do that, and, and <laughs> yeah, depends. and that's fair. That's why I said it was probably not, uh, yeah. probably more like an apples or oranges Thomas kind of a thing. But big. just trying to get kind of a kind of a sense because they they do fall into two different categories of usage and right. and audiences and interested people and things like that. You know, so. Right. So, like, you know, we got, we got the passive parks, and the, the parks that are in, uh, like, Counterpoint and Earth Day. You know, we contract that out. $50,000, we're maintaining all of them. 
You know, we got about eight parks out there that we're mm -hmm. maintaining on for fifty thousand. Um, but we we couldn't do that at Commons. We couldn't touch it for fifty thousand. Our most expensive park is Veterans. It's the electric cost out there for the fountains, um, and that one that that one's our most expensive per acre. I was going to ask this question since you mentioned it. The veterans, the the military statutes yeah. at veterans, is that in this budget to uh, address that? No. No, that that's that was put on the horizon. That was not put in for the next year to replace those. How much were we looking at for that? One hundred and five thousand, I think, Something was like that. was a ballpark cost to replace them all. I'd be interested in comments from council on whether we want to leave that on the horizon or include that in this budget. Is is there any any way to refurbish them without having to replace them? So that they 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 look pretty shabby right now. Actually, I have a contractor, and I talked to them prior, just before I went out, and um, I talked to them again this morning about. They refurbished the uh, first responders. I don't know if you you noticed saw, that. Yeah, I did. And, uh, I saw we that. wanted him to do the uh, uh, the military. The military. Yeah, yeah. and uh, what it'll do, it'll clean it up, but um, it's they're stick figures. Six figures. To, no, 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 no. You said what did they're you say? Stick figures. Stick if you look figures. at the the two. Oh, oh there are six memorial. figures. Yeah, there's. Okay. It's. No, and, uh, no comparison. Yeah, for, from my point of view, I think it'd be certainly worthwhile to do the refurbishment of it um, as an interim and take yeah. it up at the next strategic yeah. planning. Refurbish was there, but I got, I'm getting the impression you don't think it's worth spending the money to refurbish, to just re do no, it? I, no, on the contrary, I th it needs to be done. And it'll, it'll cost about $1,800. All right, and that's to do to what? Clean it, that's to clean, clean up what we up. have? Right, right. All right, so that's 18, mm -hmm. you said? All right, and then what would we do then? Look at the next uh, budget cycle to completely redo them? Is that what you're suggesting? I mean, basically, I'm, I'm looking because I want them to look good for Veterans Day, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so is there a consensus that we should let them do the refurbish yeah. this cycle? I sure. Yeah? Refurbish? Yeah. Yeah. Right? You got that? I do. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Anything else? No? Thank you, Lou. Okay. Okay, you're going to go into the capital budget now? I just want to take a break before you do that. At the beginning of our uh, agenda, we had a, a statement to take comments from the public. I thought it would be better to go through the budget process and have discussion and give something to the public if they wanted to comment to comment on. Um, and I did that because I had no previous comment cards pre-submitted. So it wasn't like someone looked at the budget and had submitted their cards. So the, the public uh, is still open. We're still open for comments on this budget for the rem as we continue through the meeting. I just wanted to point that out. If anyone would like to comment up to this point, now you can come up. If not, you want to wait until the final presentation on the capital budget. That'll be fine. I'm leaving public comment open for that period. So, seeing none, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. I'm pleased to present the, <coughs> the Village's Capital Improvement Plan for fiscal years 2020 to 2024. The first slide is a summary for 2020 of revenues and expenditures by funds with a, a total $18.4 million in revenues and expenditures at $9.4 million. The first fund is the recreational facility funds, which is limited to the procurement of parks and recs facilities and equipment. Uh, the only project in this one is the Royal Palm Beach Commons parking lot expansion, which was previously in the budget, and we're, we're actively designing this project now. Next fund is the beautification fund, uh, which is dedicated to landscaping and enhanced visual perception of the village. 
Uh, this project entails improving the landscaping from Folsom to Crestwood Boulevard along Okeechobee Boulevard. We'll be adding irrigation and landscaping uh, within the median and, and edges of roadway. The next fund is the impact fee fund, uh, which is the, is the funding comes from new development and it's limited to constructing new roads, buildings, public parks, and public buildings. Oops, said that twice. Uh, the first project is the Madrid connection to State Road 7. Uh, this project involves a, a connection at the existing Madrid Circle and connecting that to uh, the State Road 7. Uh, we have actively, uh, we hired a consultant to go ahead and, and provide us with a study. Uh, so we, State Road 7 is on hold, but we expect construction to, to be coming forward soon. So if this project uh, were to move forward, we would want to have an answer on uh, when that happens, probably around April. So we, we can include this with their construction. Uh, the concept at the strategic planning session was to have a write out only here. And that's what we're studying is both the write out only option and, and a full connection. Real quick, the extension that they're talking about, the widening then, it's going to be on the west side of what is currently there. So making it all two lanes or four lanes in one, it was a doing two lanes in one direction and then two lanes. That is correct. <clears throat> but obviously they're going to need to look at it, the number of vehicles that will be coming out of this intersection, whether a signal will be justified or, or and, and obviously that, making the physical connection for the, the, the turnouts. Well, yeah, and the study that Chris is doing will be right out only and right, a yeah. full intersect, uh, well, full T intersection. Um, and then we'll present that to you guys in a, in a workshop in, in April. Okay. Want to move on? Yes, please, thank you. And this is a summary of the, the other projects that were previously in the, the budget. If you have any questions on these, these we can go through them now, or, or if you want to wait till the end of the presentation, however you want to deal with it. People, I, they will ask their questions they can ask as we go along. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, next one is the local discretionary sales surtax fund, which is from the one cents sales tax. Um, and that's limited to, to facilities and equipment that are going to last greater than five years. Uh, this first slide, I apologize, there's a, there's a lot of detail on here, but the, the point of this is this is the common park access points. If you look at the bottom of the slide, there's, there's a scale on there. That represents one mile. And uh, to give an example, if, if if you look at the counterpoint, the, the kind of the lower end of counterpoint, somebody today has to drive a little over five miles to, to get to Commons. Um, if we were to make a connection, they could be within a quarter miles to Commons at, at that, that lower end of the park at the, the southeast corner. And, it, and it's not just to Commons. It, it also opens up the opportunity for them to go to other places in the village and utilize our, our park pathway system. So. Everything in, in red here is off-street bike facilities, which the majority of people that use bicycles, especially with, with younger children, prefer these types of facilities. So if, if we create these strategic access points, not only here but throughout the village, uh, it, makes, it increases the probability that somebody is going to, instead of getting in their vehicle, choose to get on a bicycle or walk. Uh, to, to the destination they're going, and, and that could be a, a park or it could be a restaurant. So in Commons, because it's centrally located, is, is a great opportunity to, to connect lots of facilities. You can see on this map, we got Village Hall, we have the Recreation Center, uh, we have, you can see Crestwood Boulevard on, on Boulevard on the west end, Okeechobee on the north end of it with our Village Hall, the Cultural Center is all there and this is all within one mile radius if we make these these strategic connection points uh, for our residents and, and obviously you can see a whole lot of, of homes within these areas and we'll be bringing that back to council with a workshop i think either in later this year or first of next year it's on the strategic plan one of those two i think february, it's february is it february yes. okay we'll be bringing it to you in a workshop okay 
or a council meeting. And this next one is, is the largest item in, in the capital improvement plan, and, and this is Village Hall. Uh, but this project did evolve over time, which I think is a testament to our strategic planning process and, and our capital improvement process. Uh, we, we started looking at Village Hall as it related to the function of our lobby. Uh, probably 10 years ago, we kind of switched the, the, the front to the back, uh, and we never really addressed the lobby at that time. So we started looking at the lobby. We started looking at the deficiencies in the building as it, as it relates to having a, a, a break area for the employees. Uh, we looked at the restroom facilities. There were ADA requirements that, that, that needed to happen. Unfortunately, the ADA requirements came at the expense of, of stalls, so we were going to actually have a reduction in capacity in our restrooms. To make those improvements, we have on one half of the building, we have a mezzanine, which is not accessible. Uh, so when we started to look at all those options, uh, we, we decided we thought it would be a good idea to bring on a consultant to, to weigh the, the, the pros and, and cons of, of renovating the existing building versus coming up with, with a new building. Uh, when we did that, uh, there, there was a lot of actually strong pros for creating the new building. Uh, one uh, big example is, is during emergency uh, response. Right now, if we have a hurricane in the window, we literally have to shut down Village Hall because we have to move our, our IS operations, which is, is our computer systems, which is the backbone of, of responding to one of these incidents, over to the, the, the David, B, David B. Farber which is a smaller facility, if the existing village hall were to get impacted by a storm, which is, is not uh, capable of withstanding a, a modern storm, uh, we, we would have to, to run operations out of, of a pretty small building, which, which would be difficult to, to both run responses to the storm and start getting, issuing building permits. So when we looked at, at that, and then, we, then it, it kind of evolved into the possibility of grants for, for generating the EOC. So there, there's potential funding sources in, in creating a new building. There's energy savings that, that are going to be realized through the building. Uh, there's efficiencies created by that new space. Uh, the Village Hall, we were going to have to add sections all around the building to, to accommodate what we expected as growth in the next 10 years. and. The other thing was is our lobby. Right now, we have two separate lobbies to, to come into the building. We have a lot of customers that, that come in. They, they get lost in our, our building. They're shuffled back and forth. So the, the idea of, of creating a new facility, we could create a centralized lobby where, where people come in and, and all the services are kind of off of that, that main lobby. Um, And we don't have to relocate during construction if we do that, a new that was, building. That was going to be the next. <laughs> we did, we, as, as part of the study, we, we, we did we looked at the building across the street and potentially leasing that. Uh, we looked at creating a trailer village, and then we said, "Hey, we we have a, a pretty good sized site here. Why don't we build the building next to our existing building? Completely maintain op operations during construction." and then only move once rather than twice and, and less the expense of, of the temporary facilities, which, which is probably about $400,000 in savings in that. And then the other amazing thing about the new building is it's actually cheaper to, to construct that than it is to renovate Village Hall. Um, so all those issues combined uh, and, and through the strategic planning process, we, we evolved into building an entire new facility. And then is the thought to demo the current building and then that would be green space? Correct, and, and, and obviously some parking re would need to be reconfigured as part of that, but certainly we, we could create more green space with a two-story two building versus a single-story building. There would be some additional parking. Bradford's going to make us put park it. <laughs> <laughs> the code's going to make That's us park it. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and we will we will create a, a, a plaza area out there. And 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 the other part of it was was the upgrading the exterior of the buildings and and making all the buildings match on campus. This will give us an opportunity to do that as well. And. and 
really create a, a, a top-notch facility for the residents. You show two footprints here. Which one are you uh, suggesting? We're not there yet. Okay. Uh, these work are in progress. Very, they're very schematic in nature. Okay. And we, we haven't explored underground utilities and, and the costs associated with the different layouts. And, okay. And obviously, the idea is, is we're going to bring an architect on board for this. We'll go through the RFQ process. and. Okay. and people that specialize in this type of thing are, are going to create create options for us that, that really make sense for this campus. And we won't just tell them the one on the right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. And the next project is Robner Park Pathway and Kayak Launch. What this is, is initially we started at just looking at resurfacing the pathways within the park. Uh, we went out there. there, there are some ADA accessibility issues along the existing pathways. Uh, we do have a need for launching our, our aquatic vegetation equipment out of this facility. As, when they do that now, it tears apart the banks and, and obviously that has to be regraded, resodded every time they do that. So the thought would, would be that we would take an existing pathway connection, make it a little wider so that the equipment could launch down there and then create a dual purpose launch uh, with a, a kayak launch and then for the two, possibly two weeks a year when the harvester is there, it, it, would, it would house that harvester. So, and then there were some other uh, connection points uh, within the neighborhood that, that we were gonna make as part of this. We just transferred funds from the fencing of the park out. So is that back in with this budget? That, so to that replace will be, that'll be okay. part of this overall. The existing dog park fencing is going to be replaced as part of this. We'll make it one large project. Uh, the next project is the all access playground at, at Commons. Uh, we identified that it was going to be at Commons and then the next step was where we're going to put this. Uh, we looked all over the site for, for something that made sense, and, and sure enough, lo and behold, the, the existing playground, expanding the existing playgrounds is, is really what makes sense here. Uh, we could add these the additional equipment uh, for, for all users and expand those existing uh, playgrounds, keep the symmetry of, of the lawn, and, and keep everybody in the same place. Uh, we did look at other locations, but it was going to essentially isolate the playground and, and, and the users of that playground from, from the other users, and, and we really didn't think that was a good idea. So this is, this is kind of what we ended up with. So. And, and we, we did not receive a CBR IR grant that we applied for this, so we're going to go ahead and actively seek additional grants for it. We think it's a, it's a great candidate for grant funding, so we are going to continue uh, pursuing grant funding options. Was that because the state didn't fund that? Correct. Sure? Okay. Uh, the next major project is, is the Recreation Center renovation and expansion. Uh, this started with, with what you see is the 5,500 square foot uh, portion of it on, on the, s the south side of the building. And uh, I guess the, the plans for the, the gym have been around for probably over, over 20 years from, from when it was originally constructed. Uh, we thought this was a, a good opportunity to not only do this expansion, but go ahead and create that additional recreation space. Um, and um, basically, uh, you're ending up with four meeting rooms, additional restrooms, an additional kitchen, a security reception desk, and the gymnasium, and then ADA improvements throughout the building to, to bring it to the current code. We might also look at the option of doing a pedestrian bicycle path from Crestwood uh, to this building. It's uh, it's actually pretty close. That would be great. Yeah. Yes, it, it, we're going to modernize the entire building. So it's, it's been around for 25 plus years, so we think it's time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, the next project is road resurfacing. This is consistent with, with our overall, our long range plan. And we've just kind of highlighted what we're going to be doing in 2022. 
Uh, the next project is, is the, the canal system dredging. We did get our, our half million dollar grant, uh, which is great. So what, what we're gonna do now is, is we've done the majority of the design for this, we, we've gone through the entire canal system. We've done cross sections, looking at the, the, the depth of muck. Uh, now this project, we have enough funding to, to, to do a substantial mobilization and, and really just get the most bang for our bucks. So we're gonna target shallow areas with, with extensive muck and, and we're gonna improve those cross sections and, and get that, that material out of our canal system, which ultimately will improve water quality and, and it'll help with our, our vegetation maintenance. Is that the budget for the, everything that's in that yellow red? No, that, this, this is just an example of... <laughs> but that's pretty good <laughs> No. <clears throat> and then uh, this is a list of the, uh, all the projects within 302. So if you have one of these projects, you have a question on them? If, I don't know if I see it here. The, <clears throat> the, I don't know what you call it, the carport thing we're going to do at the cultural Coming center? Coming up. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> 303. So this is our, our general capital improvement fund program. Uh, the first project is, is really, this is the, the low hanging fruit as it relates to the village. FPL uh, will change out lights at, at $0 cost. Obviously they're subsidizing over that time, but they'll come in and change out the, the traditional lights with, with more energy efficient LED lights. Uh, we, we do wanna spend a little bit of money and, and understand what that change is gonna mean to the neighborhoods. Uh, obviously. The, with LED lights, you have the ability to put more light out per fixture. Uh, the tone of that light matters, so we do want to spend a little time understanding what that's that's going to be mean to the residents, and make sure uh, that the changes that we make make sense for for the different road types uh, that that we uh, change out. What, what street is this in the picture? Yeah, that is is. This was taken off the internet, is my guess. <laughs> that's, that's Main Street this somewhere. This is—it's an example of, it, of converting it's in the village, from. Right? It's in the <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. So, so the lighting looks a little. Well, it looks so. like a before and after. Is that what that's? Yeah, that, that's exactly what it is. So the lighting off to the distance on the picture on the right. The light, the, the right-hand side is is the LED option. Uh, you could see that the difference in the glare on the fixtures, which, which is a big advantage with the LEDs, that you could go with exclusively cut off fixtures and, they, and they're able to project the light. So now when, you, when you're walking down the neighborhood, you, you're, you're seeing the big glowing lights. A, a lot of that will go away with this. So we just need to pick the right tone. Pe people in residential areas don't want it to look like a, a downtown city street. So we, we got to find out what, what the, the, the correct lighting level is going to be for those areas. Is, is the lighting going to be something similar to what we see out on Southern? Okeechobee, you mean, or with the new no, project? No, out, out on Southern Boulevard. No. Uh, it's it's going, to, going to be different than that. That Not an LED? Metal halide. All right. On Okeechobee, they, they actually replaced some of the existing lights with the LED, so you could see those okay. tonight if you, for the ones that are on. And then obviously, with once the project's complete, you'll get to see all of Okeechobee. But I can tell you, Okeechobee Boulevard is, is, is well illuminated. So it, it's not the target <coughs> levels that you want for a residential area. I, th I, th I think it would make people unhappy if it, it felt like day when they went out of their house. And, and Okeechobee will, will be closer to that. So. Uh, the next project is Earth Day Park. On the left, you could see the, the, the erosion on the canal bank from, from the, uh, this is a wake zone in that area. Uh, the irrigation piping is actually exposed here, and, mm. the, and on the right would be an example of how we'd stabilize that bank with, with riprap. Uh, the next project, this, this is uh, in the budget. We're going to seek grant funding for this. We'll, we'll go for a TPA grant, and this will be for the remaining areas in the village, hopefully, uh, that have um, curb ramps that, that don't meet current standards where there's connectivity issues on, on our existing sidewalks, similar to what, what we actually just awarded. So this would be kind of a part two to that. Uh, 
This is at Royal Palm Beach Commons. There's, there's two entrances into the, the sporting center. Uh, you can see in the picture on the left, we, we have some erosion underneath the walkway. Uh, we'd be looking to put a retaining wall similar to, to the retaining wall on the, white, the right, which is actually at, at Royal Palm Beach Commons um, on, along those, those two ramps. And this is what Fred was alluding to. This, this will be the covered entrance at the cultural center and a, a wedding pavilion. Okay. The next project is Camellia Park renovations. The, the restroom out there is at an age where I, I can't find it in my as built so it's pretty, it's pretty old. Uh, <laughs> we, we did retrofit it probably about 10 years ago, uh, but it, it, it's in need of being replaced. So this project will replace the, the restroom and along with the, the uh, Tennis Pro office and then we would resurface the tennis courts at the same time and, and upgrade that lighting to, to LED lighting. This next project is, is bringing the beach to Royal Palm Beach Commons. Oh, okay. So, so the, so read the, my mind. What, what you've been waiting for. So the thought behind this project, and, and, and obviously this is out at the end of the five-year budget, so that it's pretty rough, but we would, this is a, kind of a low-lying area over here. We would bring in beach sand to that area, some type of water feature, and then improve the connectivity to the Great Lawn so people can get there easier with, with a pedestrian bridge. So put some nice palm trees in there and maybe some hammocks to, to uh, mimic Beach we, light is that going to encourage right? people to go in into the water, though? I, I, Are we going to put up a barrier really to keep them out? Because I'm. Um, I, I think we would just. We beach, would we we create an obstacle to the water. Who go first? <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to ask. Have we? I know we had some questions that came up about water quality. Are we beyond that? Or are we still reviewing that? Well, if if I mean if you if we had it for swimming, it, it totally changes how we have to deal with that and how often we'd have to test it. And my guess would be there is no way we could maintain the condition of the water through the hot months of the summer for swimming. All right, so to the point that I think that, uh, that uh, Richard is raising is, so we'll, we'll put up a sign saying no swimming, but you swim at your own risk or? We, we could put barriers up. Barriers, barriers. Alligators. There's a lot of turtles barriers. in there. There are no barriers. alligators. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff? Oh, I, 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 I was just going to let it go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good. Okay. We, we, we can come up with some op creative options to, to keep yeah. people from Beach on. Right. really freely <laughs> going into the water. <laughs> The next project is, is the roadway crack ceiling project, and it's just that, is, is with the recent survey of our roadway system, we're gonna identify where roads are cracking before uh, they should be, and we're gonna look to extend the life with this program of, of our roadway sections. Uh, this, this project is a contingency project in the event that at the state level they're gonna make changes to our ability to spray our canals um, with chemicals. Uh, this would be the purchase of a harvester because mechanical harvesting would be the only option if we, if we weren't able to use herbicides to uh, deal with the aquatic vegetation. So it's kind of a backup plan that's, that's out in the... You, you anticipate that the state will make changes? It, it, it was actually, I think it was... It was proposed it was this year, proposed but it did this not pass. Year. The last session, it didn't, nothing happened. It did not pass. Okay. No, it was always next session, yeah. There is. Uh, <clears throat> this is the um, Crestwood entry sign on the corner of Crestwood and Okeechobee Boulevard. It would be adding some landscaping to that. It would tie into the irrigation from, from that other project and en enhance this entry feature. And then the remaining slides are the 303 three projects that were previously in the budget.
And then we come to the stormwater improvement fund. And there, there's a single project in that, which is the improvements at Camellia Park. Initially, it would be upgrading the drainage system for the, the parking lot um, on the north side of the park. And then uh, in the future, there would be some dredging of, of a canal that runs adjacent to it and uh, possibly filling in some areas as well to, to make better connectivity between Cam Camellia and uh, Seminole. And that concludes my presentation. Do you have, real quick here, there are two, the bus shelters, you have $990 as the carryover. Did we purchase two, or is that two shelters that we're just gonna install, or do we know? I need Paul to answer that. Sorry, <laughs> I, can, I can always ask him later. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. I'm more than happy to come back out and, and pinch hit for Chris on this. Uh, <laughs> okay. This, this is so easy. He's calling the guys from the gallery out to help. Uh, now, that, uh, the, these funds are, are funds that, that we, we no longer uh, take in uh, the developer fees for, for bus shelters. So the funds that are left, uh, we have two more shelters uh, that, that uh, when we can work those out. The, the one is down there by the Walgreens where the, the state is, is widening the road. They'll put a pad down there. We'll put a shelter there. And uh, uh, we, we have that shelter in place. And then we, we have an, another location over by the Walmart. Should that, ever, uh, res that issue ever be resolved, we would put a shelter there. And then and the remaining funds will, will just be used for maintenance of the shelters. Uh, we've had them hit in the past. Uh, oddly enough, you would think that there's no way anyone down, driving down State Road 7 could hit one. But we've had... Uh, you can get airborne on those canals there on the lift. Um, so then do we, we don't have in the budget then to put one for each of them, or it's not a plan to at least, because we have several bus stops that don't have shelters. So is yeah, there... We, no, we, we've put everything out that we, we intend to put out. Okay. We just have those two locations that we have planned to put shelters in. One of one of those locations we have the shelter uh, in house. Uh, the, the other one we would have to to purchase a shelter uh, to put it there, uh, or at least some parts to it. Okay. Uh, but the, the, whatever the remaining funds are beyond that uh, would would be for maintenance. Or then, for as example, far as the other locations, the, the, we had one we we replaced the top. Right. Uh, over at uh, uh, at uh, near uh, Partridge. But like on State Road 7 and, and uh, Okeechobee on the south side of the street, there isn't a shelter there. We have no intentions of putting one there. Is that, that's my no, question. No, Okay. We have no intention. Thanks. But, All right. They changed the funding model for, for uh, the funding model for funding both sh shelters has, has been modified? We, we, we uh, no longer charge that as part of our development fees. Or is we're not we're not collecting. That's correct. We're not collecting it. So we we have no mechanism, or are we dependent upon the county. For for the well, the point, yes. Yeah. The what we did is, it, is if you if we want more bus shelters, right. how do we do that? How do we fund? If it? you remember, three four years ago, um, we evaluated all the bus stops. We did get with Palm Tram. We we evaluated all the bus stops and um, identified the ones that we wanted bus stops at. We've done those and and the others. We, we chose not to do bus stops at. And it was based on the number of people that were at them. Ridership. And, and ridership. And Palm Trans desire to potentially move them. I mean, when, if we were just go out and put them out there, they that. move a lot. And, and yeah, the ones we didn't put them at. They said, oh, we're not stopping correct, them anymore. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Well, and it changes. It does change quite a bit. So, so we, that's when we yeah. finished that and chose to stop charging. Can we do? Palm Trans has just gone through a redesign of their... Their, uh, their whole system, and they're they've been rolling it out for the last, I don't know, year or so. Uh, perhaps we should find out from them, do, we, do, do they anticipate the same rate of bus stop movement that they had before? Then if that's the case, maybe we could reevaluate where we think they might, you know, based on the new ridership model and the new routes, take a look at that. And even if it's not just the shelter, the um, uh, bench, Exactly, because that was the other thing. Is though there? I mean, there's just the stop and no place it. for people to sit. Right. Yeah, I agree. and there's nothing no. there at all right now. I, listen, that, we we're moving down a path where there's a much broader discussion and uh, many moving parts to providing and enhancing other transportation options. You've heard me say this before. 
Let's give people the option of not having to take their car. Believe it or not, this conversation about better bus stops or more bus stops, place to sit, is part of that. It's part of that that overall the strategy. So more comfortable areas. Yeah, Thank sure. That any other questions? Yeah, I was just going to throw in on that one. Just, oh, I'm sorry. So what was standing? What, what remind me of what's standing away for the Walmart bus stop? Because unless you've stood out there for 15, 20 minutes waiting, this is this you is have no really idea easy, how. Sir, I'm going to throw it back over to Chris. <laughs> Whoa! Okay. No, uh, no, you, I, got, I, you guys Brad, are really you wanna, good. <laughs> this pickleball? We don't uh, we don't own, own the land. Is what stands in the way. Who owns it? Walmart. Walmart. So it's a matter of get convincing them. It, it was it was part of their development as for art and public places. Yeah, maybe, really? Yes, sir. Maybe part of this part of this discussion about and all of it makes good sense. We Go talk about them. want to encourage ridership. Um, you got to have a place that's decent to wait for a bus. Um, one argument is you want to save one shopping cart over at Walmart instead of having people sitting on them. <laughs> I swear they do. Yeah. Okay. Um, huh? they, they might be worthwhile continuing that conversation. Yeah, yeah. We do have that conversation. If you remember, Walmart was in truth uh, development review not too long ago, wanting to modify their stores and 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 get some variances, and that was that absolutely was part of the the conversation. Not only there, but actually a better bus stop than the one that the Palm Tram one. It was a little bit further down um, near the Bennett Auto Supply, I believe, right. somewhere in that area yeah. there. Uh, so we definitely keep those conversations open uh, with Walmart and with um, Palm Tram. It, it's a good thing because obviously you're not going to encourage ridership putting people out there and we know that so okay thank you we can we see if we can move the dial on that that issue I take it I don't know what level of the kind of dialogue that's going on now but let's leave it in part to them that it's something like we really like to see get get accomplished so 50 /50 on it. I didn't say that Let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put the bench they put the cover. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? Anybody else? Any other questions? Is that it, Chris? That's it. Okay. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. You want anything add anything to that, uh, Ray? No. <laughs> no. Snatch, <laughs> you don't snatch defeat as jaws of victory, right? Okay. Um, Public comment is still, we're still open for public comment. If anyone from the public would like to comment at this time on anything we discussed this evening, now would be the time. I have no, car, no, no car, comment cards were submitted, but I am opening the floor up still. All right, seeing none, then we will close public comment then on the night's, tonight's budget hearing. And what's next for the budget? What's our next step? We will come back to you in the July 18th meeting uh, with a resolution. Um, with the budget numbers and and the mac and the the no millage rate. rate that uh, we can't go over from that point forward. You know, once we set the millage rate at the next meeting, stuck. We can't go over it. We can go below it. But <laughs> and right now we're still looking at maintaining the same millage rate. That is correct. So, okay. Then with that, um, thank you all. I appreciate the participation and good conversation and thoughts. And um, I think we're in good shape going forward for another. Uh, our next uh, fiscal cycle. So we stand adjourned. Thank you.